Last night we talked about God is joy, God is faithful, um, God is present. And we're going to hear the whole weekend about more things about what God is, what God is like, what He is. But the first thing we have to know is, is God real? Like that's the big question, right? Like, is God real? Does He really exist? Because if He doesn't exist, then we can say, God is joy, hooray, whatever. Or God is faithful, I don't know, I don't feel Him being faithful. Or you can be here today, or last night, or whatever, and I could ask you the question, how would you respond right now, right now, if I asked you the question right now, if I were to say, is God real? Okay, would you say, would you say, yeah. Or would you say, is God real? Now, here's the thing. I appreciate the fact that you made an effort. That was really good of you. Thank you very much. I appreciate that some people are like, yes! And last night, like, if, if I were to ask you, is God real? They're like, yeah, he is! I love it! Why? Because I play in music! That means God's real, man. Like, no, 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 no. Here's the deal. If my faith is based off of a feeling, if my faith in God's existence or God's faithfulness is based off of a feeling, then my faith is only going to be as strong as that feeling. Again, if my faith is based off of an emotion, I know God is real. Why? Because I feel Him. Then my faith is only going to be as strong as that emotion. So what we need to do as Catholic Christians, we have to do this. We have to, we, we have feelings, we have emotions, those things are good, they're part of us. But we can't, we cannot come to truth by feeling our way towards there. We're just using the wrong, we're using the wrong tool. It's like this, wait. Do you guys smell purple? Do you smell purple? You, you can't smell purple right? in the same way that you can't feel the truth. You can't feel your way to the truth. You have to think your way to the truth. You have to think your way to the truth. Now, our feelings can sometimes correspond with the truth. For example, I'm loved and I feel loved. Oh, great, great, that's perfect. But have you ever had this, this in your life where you know you're loved but you don't feel loved? Or have you ever had this thing where like you're trying to go to bed at night and you, you've already checked under the bed and you've already checked in the closet and you know there's no one there but you still feel afraid? Yeah, sometimes our feelings, sometimes our feelings mislead us. And so what we need to do is what we absolutely need to do is we need to think our way to the truth because we're gonna, I'm going to make this claim that God is real. Now, if you're going to believe that's true, I'm going to invite you to believe it for only one reason. I would invite you to believe in Jesus for only one reason. Because he is true. Because he actually is God. Because the only reason to believe anything is because it's true. Not because it makes you happy. Not because it makes you good. Not because it helps you sleep at night. The only reason to believe anything is because it's true. So here's the big question. What is truth? This is going to be a little philosophy 101. So get your brains going, right? So philosophy 101. What is truth? How would you define truth? I can define truth. I want to define truth in two words. So just maybe make it really simple. I want to define truth by two words. Two words are this. Truth is what is. Okay, so truth is simply what is. And so a statement is either true or false to the degree that it conforms to what is. Does it make sense so far? So if I were to say there is a podium on this stage, does that conform to what is? Yes. So is that statement true? Yes. If I were to say that there are there is a microphone on the stage. Does that conform to what is? Yes. If I were to say there are eight microphones on this stage, does that conform even more accurately to what is? Yes. So that recognition of being able to say that, again, a statement is either true or false to the degree that it conforms to reality. Now, here's the deal. Here's the deal. A lot of times we have this thing where we say, like, have you ever heard this? Ever, 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 ever? I get so excited, you guys. I just can't control myself. Um, have you ever heard someone say, well, that's fine. That's your truth. But my truth is something else. Have you ever heard that someone say that? Well, that's your truth. You believe in Jesus. That's fine. That's your truth. I don't, I don't, that my truth is different. No, that's something real. That's an actual thing. There's two kinds of truth. One kind of truth is called subjective truth. That was a little philosophy. Here's a grammar lesson for this morning. Subjective truth is this. There are subjective statements. Subjective statements are things like this. I like caribou coffee. I like driving a little bit over the speed limit. I like Papa John's pizza. All those statements are true, but they're subjectively true because all those statements are about what? They're about me, exactly. Well done. They're about the subject. They're about I. And so if all we had was subjective truth, could you ever argue with me? No, because I would say, 
I like Caribou Coffee. And you might say, well, I like Starbucks. I'd say, well, I like Caribou Coffee. Well, I like Starbucks. Well, I like Caribou Coffee. I'm like, okay, fine, Doof, you know, walk away. That's because if all, we ever, if all we have is subjective truth, what I like, what I'm feeling, what I experience, if all we had was that, when it comes to conflict, we only have three options. One option is this, I like Caribou, I like Starbucks, I like Caribou, whatever, leave. Just walk away. The other option is this, I like Caribou, I like Starbucks, I like Caribou, I like Starbucks. Doof. I'm right, because I'm stronger. Or it's this, third option is this, either we walk away, we fight each other, or we say this. Y'all know who what Caribou Coffee is? Okay, some of you do. How, uh, we'd say this, I always say, okay, you guys, everyone in this, in this arena, who thinks Starbucks is better than Caribou? Raise your hand. Okay, who thinks Caribou is better than Starbucks? Okay, so then what we have is basically mob rule. So whatever, you know, the most people say, that's right, and that, then that's right. But that's not right, is it? That's not a way to come to truth. So if all we have is subjective truth, it never brings anyone together. It only brings us apart because either we walk away, we hurt each other, or we just have a mob against another mob. But the great news is there's not just subjective truth, there's also a thing called objective truth. And objective truth is something like this. You can get a medium coffee at Caribou for $2.16. The speed limit outside of this, um, on the street outside of USD is 30 miles per hour. Or you can get a medium pizza at Papa John's for $15.99. Now those statements are all objective statements because they're statements about an object outside of me. Now again, keep, keep tracking with me. They're statements that are true independent of me. For example, if the speed limit outside University of San Diego is 30 miles an hour, if I don't know that it's 30 miles an hour, does it cease to be 30 miles an hour for me? No, I have actually have a student at our university that I work at. She got pulled over by the police officer and she was going like 45 and a 30. And her excuse was this, I didn't know. And he wasn't like, oh, in that case, I understand. He was like, it's your job to know. Like if you're on the road, new drivers, if you're on the road, it's your job to know the speed limit, right? And the thing is this, the speed limit is 30 miles per hour, whether I like it, whether I know it, or whether I believe it. That's the thing about objective statements. If they're true, if they're true, they're true independent of me. They're true whether or not I like it, whether or not I know it, or whether or not I believe it. For example, we're all here inside. If it was snowing outside, this is, you can tell I'm from Minnesota. If it was snowing outside, you could say, I don't like the snow. Would that change the fact that it was snowing outside? If you didn't know that it was snowing outside, would that change whether or not it was snowing outside? If you didn't like the fact that it was snowing outside, would that change whether or not it was snowing outside? No, because it's, if something's objectively true, it's true regardless of whether you know it, like it, or believe it. So, here's this, this, this deep, profound thing. When it comes to the truth of God, is God real? Here's the question. If I were to say the phrase, the statement, God exists, is that a subjective statement or is that an objective statement? It's objective, exactly. Now, some people will say like, well, that's subjective. Why? Because people disagree. Well, yeah, exactly. Some people say, objectively, God doesn't exist. Other people say, objectively, God does exist. Question for all y'all. Can both of them be right? No, not at all. Because here's, here's the second little philosophy lesson of the morning. There's this thing called the principle of non-contradiction. Now, if you get this right, you will get so much in your life right. It's called the principle of non-contradiction, which means this. Again, get your, ready, get your pens all ready, you know, type it out on your phones. It means this. A thing cannot both be and not be at the same time and in the same way. I will repeat that four more times. A thing, a thing cannot both be and not be at the same time and in the same way. No, because I always say this to my students, I always have to say the in the same way thing as well, because I'll always have like the smart aleck student, you know, which is what I used to be. Uh, someone will say like, okay, what about if you had the lamp, a lamp that was on a table, but it was turned off? It's both on and off, busted father. Like, no, at the same time and in the same way. So if the lamp is on the table, it can't also be off the table, amen? So. God cannot both exist and not exist. And here's the crazy thing about this. Sometimes we just like to say, well, that's fine. If God doesn't exist for you, then that's whatever. But God exists for me. 
we can't both be right. No, no, some people don't care. Some people don't care about whether or not God exists. In fact, I, I was doing a marriage prep with this couple, and, and she was raised Catholic, and she was trying to live out her faith a little bit. He was raised Catholic, but then he left, and he said, I'm an atheist. I do not believe God exists. And this kept coming up in our marriage preparation. It was like every time I kept bringing it up, like, you realize you're marrying each other. You really disagree. You really disagree. Finally, one night, we're talking, and I said, you realize I'm really concerned about this because you're about to covenant yourselves to someone who believes that when it comes to the most important question in life, they actually believe that you are wrong. You're about to marry someone who when it comes to the most important question of life, whether God exists or not, they actually think that you're wrong. And the, the groom, he looked at me and he said, well, I don't think it's the most important question in life. And I was like, exactly, that's the point. Because you could, so a lot of times you have atheists, you have new atheists, and I'm not bagging on atheists because there's a sincerely held belief. But I want to say this. I want, I want atheists who are better atheists. So what I mean by that is this. If someone's going to be atheist, I want them to take their atheism, their statement that God does not exist, I want them to take that to the conclusion. What are some cl conclusions to the statement? What if God didn't exist? Here's my groom who says, I don't believe it's the most important question in life. What changes if God doesn't exist? I want to say three, at least three things change. Here's the three things. If God doesn't exist, what does that mean about the universe? It means that all there is in the world is just matter. It's just stuff. That all, there's no spirit, there's no soul, there's no, like, there's no beings outside. It's all that's in the universe is just stuff. If all there is in the universe is just stuff, that means that at the moment of the Big Bang, all it was is just, you know, you've heard the theory of the Big Bang, right? So all the matter in the universe is super condensed in this ball, the size of grapefruit or whatever. And then it expands at this explosion, rapidly expanding exponential rate at a certain temperature and a certain speed. Now, if all there is is matter, then all the matter in the universe existed at that moment, which means this. At the very first instant of the Big Bang, the entire future of the universe was predetermined. Here's what I mean. If all there is is matter, then all there is is physics. I don't know, I don't ever recommend playing pool with a physics major because they will kick your butt. They are so good, because why? Because they know how physics works, it always works this way. If you hit the ball, or the, you know, the balls in this speed at that angle, they will always do this. So here's the thing, if at the moment of the Big Bang, the moment, the first moment of creation, all there is is matter, it just expands, all there is for the rest of history is just stuff hitting stuff hitting stuff hitting stuff which means all it's going to be is physics, which means that the entire universe has been pre-programmed from the very first moment. So here's the thing. There's a crazy thing about that is this. Are you part of the universe? Yes. Is your brain part of the universe? Yes. Which means that if all there is is stuff, if there's no God, you're simply a part of the universe. And what you're thinking and what you're doing has been pre-programmed as well. Because your brain is simply... Atoms hitting atoms hitting atoms. It's just stuff hitting stuff hitting stuff. Which means that there's essentially no such, if there is no God, all there is is matter, there's no such thing as free will. Now, you might think, no, people don't really believe that. I, there's a guy, an atheist on our, my campus, who believes that. He's what they call a determinist, which means that everything has been predetermined. Why? Because all there is is matter. It's just stuff hitting stuff hitting stuff. It's just physics. And he's at the point, this is crazy, it boggles my mind. This guy is a professor at a university. Why, why it boggles my mind is this. If you think that the whole universe is pre-programmed, why would you teach? Because it's just kind of pre-programmed, right? Not only that, he teaches ethics, which is like right human behavior. But if you don't believe in such a thing as free will, there's no such thing as right or wrong. If there's no such thing as free will, there's no such thing as right or wrong. And that's the, that's the second, second conclusion of no God. If there is no God, there is no free will. But if there's no free will, there's no such thing as right or wrong. Because you can't blame me for doing something. I had no choice. And you can't praise me for doing something. I had no choice. If there is no free will, there's no right or wrong. I'm just doing what I have to do. And that's, think about this. If you went up to a pop machine, and your pop machine, you put your money in, you press the button, and your pop machine doesn't give you your pop, do you stand there and say, now see here, pop machine, we had an agreement. I was going to give you my $2, you are going to give me my pop. So let's reason this out. Would you argue with the pop machine? No. What would you do? You'd kick it. Exactly so. So if there's no such thing as free will and you had a disagreement with someone where you say, I think Caribou coffee is better, and they say it's not, 
What do you do with them? Do you try to reason with them or what do you do? You kick them. That's what you have to do. Again, if there's no such thing as God, there is no free will. If there's no free will, there's no right or wrong. There's just, just what is. The third consequence is this. What is doesn't mean anything. It's, it's, it's redoc, re, redonkulous. Wow, take me back to 2007, right? Um, it's completely ridiculous. If there's no God, that means there's no meaning. Here's what I mean. Um, a number of years ago, I went down to North Carolina, and I was with our, we have focused missionaries on our campus at, at the University of Minnesota, Duluth. And I was meeting our new team, and so we wanted to do a team bonding exercise. So they, wanted, they took me out. They said, Father, we're going to go to an art show at an art gallery in order to bond, because there's nothing that bonds people better than shared misery. And, and so, <laughs> no, it was great. But I, I love art. I just don't like postmodern art, because postmodern art is kind of like, here is a toilet seat. I did that. I'm like, look inside. I did that. Um, like this, <laughs> this recognition of like, what does it mean? So I'm walking through this thing going like, I don't know what anything means here. And then finally I stumbled upon this painting. It was huge. It was like 15 feet by 15 feet. And all it was was the color red. And it was striking. It was beautiful, you guys. So I, I mean, honestly, I, I, I stood there and I was like, wow. And I stood there for 15 minutes. I'm not exaggerating. Looking at the color red. I didn't just stand there like, oh. I stood there like an art person. You know how art people stand? One hand kind of around the waist. The other one stroking your chin. It's kind of nodding. Art. So I must have looked like I knew what I was doing because these two guys walk up to me and they walked up and they were like, they saw me and look. So, and they asked me, what do you see? I'm embarrassed, but for the next 15 minutes, I described the color red. Well, here it is. I mean, this is red is just as passionate, and there's a couple smudges there. That's probably like, you know, the brokenness of the human condition. I mean, for 30 minutes of my life that I will never get back, I looked at the color red. Now, I talked about for 15 minutes what the painting meant. But if I really wanted to know what the painting meant, who would I have to talk to? The artist, exactly. If I really wanted to know what the painting meant, I would have to talk to the artist. So imagine she walked up, it was a woman. Imagine she walked up and I said, okay, I just went off about what this painting means. What does it really mean? What if she looked at me and she said, actually, there's a funny story about that painting. It was just a canvas I had laid out. I was gonna paint something else, but I've got these cats and they knocked over this red paint. I hung it up to dry it and just kind of, I was like, that's pretty. So I hung it up in the gallery. So basically the painting means Nothing. The painting was an accident. I mean, if the painting was an accident, even if I find meaning in it, does it mean anything? No, because if it's an accident, there is no meaning in it. Yeah, I might say, but you know, but I see something. When it comes to the universe, if the universe is just an accident, it was a random thing that just happened to like explode at one moment in time. And now here we are. Even if I find what I feel like is meaning, like I love this person or I'm suffering in this way or whatever, I have this kind of joy. If the universe is an accident, does it have any meaning? No. If there is no God, that means the whole universe is just an accident. If you ever have younger siblings who are like two years old and they have an accident, do you look into that for meaning? No, you don't, you don't say like, what is this? What does it mean? It's a double rainbow, almost a triple rainbow. Like, like you wouldn't look into an accident for meaning. And if the whole universe is accident, that means basically the whole universe is just a dirty diaper. If the universe is accident, if God doesn't exist, that means this whole planet is simply, a literally, well, virtually, a pile of crap. And you are a nice little speck on that pile of crap. So I don't believe it's the most important question in life. Okay, either, I'm talking to the bride at this point, I'm like, okay, so your husband doesn't believe, or your future husband doesn't believe that God exists, which means he doesn't believe in free will. But in a couple weeks, he's gonna promise to love you forever. Maybe. He doesn't believe in right or wrong, but he promises he's going to be good and faithful to you. What does that mean? And he doesn't believe that there's actually a meaning to the universe, but at some point he's going to 
hold, look you in the eyes and tell you that he loves you. He's going to hold your child and say this means something. But not that none of it means anything. If there is no God, there is no free will. There is no right or wrong, and there is no meaning. But the great thing is this. I would say that's false. I would say God does exist. I would say that God is real. Not only because of this, not only because you realize, you realize, right, you had a choice this morning of whether you're going to have orange juice or milk. You had a choice this morning of whether you're going to get up or stay in. You had a choice this morning of what, if you're going to stay awake right now or go to sleep right now. You have a choice of whether you're going to listen to that urge that says, I have to go to the bathroom, or you're going to say, no, this is so amazing that I want to stay here. You have a choice. We realize we have an experience of free will. Second thing is this. You know there's a difference between right and wrong. Sometimes we disagree with, with what that is. But you know, you know that there's some things that I just should not do. And there's some things I should always do. You know this. And at the heart of hearts, we sometimes realize that this world is confusing. We don't know what it means. But we always have the sense that it's got to mean something. Our experience tells us that there is meaning, that there is right or wrong, and that there is free will, which tells us what? God is real. That God is real. I mean, in the, in the greatest, the, some of the greatest minds in history, I mean, I'm talking the best scientist, the guy who invented the Big Bang Theory, he was a Catholic priest. Not the TV show, but the actual, like, Big Bang Theory. The, the, the person who was the father, father of modern genetics was a Benedictine monk and a priest. One of Albert Einstein's closest friends were Catholic priests who were scientists. The Vatican has an, an observatory where they study physics and they study astrono astronomy and like astrophysics. They have, the Catholic Church is a friend of the sciences. It's amazing. In fact, as I, I don't know if I said this, the scientific method was developed by guess who? The Catholic Church! I'm not taking credit for it, I'm just saying, you know. But this reality is this is that faith and science are not, are not opposed, and the greatest minds, the most intelligent people in the history of the universe, the history of humanity, many, many, many of them have been Catholics, have been people who believed that God is real. But here's a crazy thing. God isn't just real. God isn't just real. He's here. God isn't just real. He's not just some of this mysterious force. He's not one of like, He's either Shiva, or he's Zeus, or he's Apollo, or he's, you know, Krishna. But at one point in history, God reveals that he has come on this earth as one of us. This is crazy. I want to make the, make the claim of this. I grew up in college, or I grew up in, I was, went to college, and I used to take a number of classes called comparative religions. And in comparative religion class, what you do is, okay, all these religions that believe that God exists of some sort, here's all these different, so you look at Hinduism and Buddhism and Taoism and Hindu, uh, Hinduism and Islam and Judaism and Christianity, and you all look at them next to each other and all look at them as if they're the same thing. But the crazy thing is this, one of those religions is definitely not like the other. Out of all these religions the world, in world history, all, all the religions on the face of the earth, one of them is entirely unique. Guess which one? Christianity. Christianity is entirely unique. It's different than every other religion. Why? Because in every other world religion, someone came along and they said this. They said, either I have a revelation from God, God told me such and such, or they would say, I have insight from God, or insight into God. I've kind of peered into this. I thought about it a lot, and here it is. But Jesus came on the scene, and unlike anyone else, he didn't just say, I have insight from God or I have revelation from God. Jesus came on the scene and he said, What? I am God. That God is real and that I am Him. So here's the thing. We look at this book of comparative religions, and we have to say that, okay, here's one person who says, I have a revelation. Another person who says, I have a revelation. Here's Jesus who says, I am the revelation of God. I am Him. He doesn't just say, look to my teachings. He says, look to me, which is crazy. I mean, think about this. If someone were to come out in this room right now, if I were to come on the stage and say, hello, everyone. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to me, no one comes to the Father except through me. Would you say, okay. A lot of times that's what we think. We think that when, when Jesus was like, when he's on the face of the earth, that he came along and he said this. He said, um, before Abraham was, I am. That Jesus came on the scene and he said, if you want to live forever, you must eat my flesh and drink my blood. And people were like, just picking their nose like, okay, Jesus, that's great. You know, that's not what people did because we, oh, people back in the day, they were so dumb. I mean, they didn't even know how to use iPods. 
They didn't know how to program VCRs. They would have believed anything. They didn't believe anything. In fact, if someone came into this room and said, I'm God, what would you make them do? Prove it, exactly. You would say, no, 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 listen. Hold up. You need to prove this. So what does Jesus do? He proves it. All throughout the Gospels, especially, especially in the Gospel of John, John says that whenever Jesus does a miracle, he doesn't call it a miracle. He calls it a sign and a wonder. Which is crazy because what does it mean, sign and wonder? What do signs do? Signs point to something. Jesus makes the, what do they point to? They point to the claim that what he said is true. Jesus comes on and says, I have the ability to forgive sins. I'm God. I can do this. Remember that story of the paralyzed man, his friends lower him on the mat? Jesus looks at the guy and he says, your sins are forgiven. And they look at Jesus and say, who but God can forgive sins? And Jesus is like, I know, right? <sighs> he says, but to prove to you that I can do this. Why? Because I'm God. He says to the guy, rise, pick up your mat, and go home. And the guy picks up his mat. I love the fact, not only can the guy move now, he already knows how to walk. Double miracle. Two points. Like, keeps going. Jesus, you know, he talks to someone. Here's a guy who's, who's deaf and he's mute. He can't speak and he can't hear. And Jesus walks up to him, and I love the story. He says, Jesus puts his fingers into the man's ear and touches his tongue. Imagine you for that deaf guy. You see Jesus coming towards you? You're like, hey, like, what are you doing? What are you doing, Jesus? And he touches, and he, the guy can hear. There's a couple of stories in the Bible where Jesus comes upon someone who's dead. There's a little girl, she's 12 years old. There's this young man. And there's also Jesus' best friend named Lazarus in John chapter 11. John, in John's gospel, Lazarus has been dead for how many days? Four, exactly, Bible scholars. He's been dead for four days. And Jesus goes to the tomb of Lazarus. And he doesn't even go up to Lazarus. Like, I would think that Jesus, if he was going to resuscitate him, like, bring him back from the dead, Jesus would go up and say, okay, Lazarus, you know, CPR, like, you know, clear, breathe, you know. All he does, he has this remote control resurrection where he just says, roll away the stone. And all these people are like, no, Lazarus has been dead. He's as dead as any dead thing that's ever died, Jesus. We know what dead looks like. And even Martha in the Bible, she says, um, we also, Jesus, know what dead smells like. And he, my brother, he's not going to smell good. Jesus says, roll away the stone. And then he looks into the tomb and he says, Lazarus, come out. And then in John's gospel, John's like going nuts. Imagine, if John was like me, he would have used like 12 exclamation marks and underlined the whole thing. Bunch of smiley faces with a bunch of, you know, parentheses, parentheses, parentheses. Like, you know, smile. And he says, the dead man came out. And Jesus is like, yeah, I know. <laughs> Why? Because I am who I say I am. And who do I say I am? I say that I am God. And I'm proving that I am God, so much so that the moment when Jesus poured his life out, poured his life out and died for us, that was not the end of the story. Because not only could he resurrect this little 12-year-old girl, not only could he resurrect that young man, not only could he resurrect his friend Lazarus, but Jesus Christ himself was raised from the dead. And this is, you guys have to realize this, this is an historical fact. Our faith is not based off of our emotions or our feelings. I feel like Jesus is alive. Good for you. I know Jesus is alive, which is good for everyone. That's the reality. Because your faith, you guys, you guys, we're going we're gonna to work from this, we're going to go into Mass. And here's the reality. We're not worshiping an experience. We're going to go into Mass in just a few minutes, and we're not worshiping a feeling. We're not worshiping an emotion. We're worshiping the reality. The truth is this, that God is real. Jesus is God, and God loves you. This is the absolute and ultimate truth of the world. And if this is true, how does it change your life? And this is the end. This is the end. This is the last thing. If that's true, how does it change my life? Not if I feel it, but if it actually is true. Did you know that over 90% of Americans, over 90% of Americans say that they believe in God? Do you know that? It'd be hard to believe that if you paid attention to university professors. It'd be hard to believe that if you paid attention to the media. But over 90% of people in our country believe that God exists. And I would say if you walked into an average Catholic church on any given Sunday, most of the people there would say God exists. They would say, are you an atheist? God doesn't exist? Or are you a theist? God does exist. They would say, I'm a theist. God does exist. But there's a problem in our church right now. And our problem is this. I believe that God exists. I'm a theist. But for all practical purposes, I live like an atheist. Our problem is this. 
Not that my emotions aren't strong enough. But I believe the truth that God is real, Jesus is God, and God loves me and he loves you. But oftentimes, I live like a, what they call a practical atheism. That means for all intents and purposes, we live as if God didn't really exist. And I think it's time to stop that. I'm going to invite us to stop that today. What we're about to do is we're going to, we're going to make this transition. We're going to go actually, we're going to be here and we're going to worship the true and the living God, the God that is real. But I'm going to invite us to take that into the next step and to be able to say this, that not only is my worship going to be true, it's going to be in the spirit, it's going to be real because the God I worship is real, but I want my life to look like God is real. If someone, if someone were to look at your last seven days, would it look like in the last seven days, would your life look like the life of a theist? Or would your life look like someone who didn't even believe that God existed? Would your life look like just the stuff you did, what you, where, where you and I spent our time in the last seven days, would someone say, there is a person who believe in God's, that God is real? Or would they look at our, my life and look at your life and say, I'm not sure if that person even believes that God is really real. My invitation for all of us is this. As Catholics, I brought up some questions about, I brought, brought up some questions this morning about truth and about theism, about God's existence, about meaning. But we have to keep running with that. We have to keep walking with that. We have to keep living with that. Because if God is going to change this world, he's not going to do it through people who just say, oh yeah, I feel like God exists. And he's not going to do it through people who say, oh no, I believe God exists. He's only going to be able to do it through people who live like God is real. Amen? Yeah. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen.